Yeah, welcome at our GCP Mindset channel. Today I have a very interesting guest. We speak about medical device development in Scandinavian countries. And here with me I have uh, Helen Key. Helen is uh, the CEO of QMED Consulting. Um, she is an expert in medical devices and she has also her own uh, YouTube channel and podcast. It's called, um, like her company, QMED Consulting. Academy and yeah, thank you for being here. Thank you very much for the invitation. So hi Helen, thanks for being here. Thanks for your time to speak with me about uh, the medical device development in Scandinavian countries. I know you're an expert. You are located in Denmark and um, please tell me a little bit more about yourself and about your country. Yes, I would certainly do so. My name is Helene Kvi and I am a medical device specialist, a CEO of the company QMED Consulting. A originally a cell biologist, but worked with medical devices since way back 95, when we had just uh, the medical device directive were just issued. And I've been uh, working in different companies, implementing the directive and now the medical device regulation. QMIC Consulting are both doing consultancy and are conducting clinical uh, investigations for different clients. I am, as you say, based in Copenhagen in Denmark, and we are covering uh, Europe from uh, Denmark. But of course, Scandinavian is a little Scandinavian countries are a little special because we understand each other's language. So we are actually monitoring and uh, coping studies from Copenhagen through uh, Sweden and Norway. Finland speaks a different language uh, and therefore we have subcontractors based there. But the other countries we manage ourselves. So that was just briefly about ourselves. Okay. Yeah, great. Thank you. Uh, you uh, told me already something about the language, um, but what makes your country is so interesting for, for medical device development. I mean, I know your people uh, as very, very smart people. Yeah, I think they have uh, one of the, the highest educational level in, in Europe. Uh, very impressive. Um, I consider them always a little bit as introverted, uh, let's say it in that way. Um, but what I also know is you don't have so many people in your countries and, and what I know is it's easier to conduct clinical studies in countries where you have a lot of people. Therefore, many companies go to India, for example, um, or to other countries where you have a huge amount of people. So what makes Scandinavia a good um, region for clinical studies? Uh, there is, a, if we talk about the resources first, then um some years ago, by co coincidence, I think actually it was due to some alcohol and some politicians that kind of gave away the oil to the Norwegians, uh, meant that we uh, have for many years in Denmark focused on academic research. So we don't, we are a farmer's uh, country, uh, but uh, we have four or five large cities where most of the uh, the uh, people in Denmark are located. If we talk about uh, Denmark specifically, it's the same in Norway and Sweden. So large areas uh, that are empty, Norway and Sweden are much larger than Denmark, but we are approximately the same uh, number of people. But the academic research is really high. The educational level is, is, is quite high. And as we did give away the oil to the Norwegians, we, uh, we have to focus on something else. And uh, MedTech is what they call the golden egg for, uh, for especially Denmark. I know it's also now the oil is running out for Norway. So they are also starting focusing on the MedTech industry because it's, it's a good way to use the resources and it's where the future is for, for many of these countries to be part of the development. And, and simply this is what we are good at, the mechanics and development, both pharmaceuticals and also medical uh, devices. Sweden have had a long history for pharmaceutical uh, companies. And we also have a little smaller scale in, in Denmark. So it's kind of our DNA that 
you know, the, the larger companies, some of them are the pharmaceutical or medtech uh, companies that drives this, educates people and engage people in the development processes and, and kind of keep them uh, attracted to this, uh, to this industry. And if I should um, tell a little about the, the hospital structure. So in Scandinavian countries, we all have a stamp, we all have a number. And we okay. never disappears. <laughs> yeah. It's very rare that people disappear in a clinical study, for instance. You can always be tracked down. And that means that for clinical studies, the compliance in regards to the patient, uh, how do you say that, the follow up schedules, so the compliance for that is very high in the Scandinavian countries. And this is some of the things that we are really, uh, we say, famous or well known for is the compliance level getting the patients back to the hospital, also because the countries are small. Yeah. Uh, and in Norway and Sweden that are large, they're used to taking the helicopter to the hospital, right? So, and yeah. we are very, um, as I say, we are we very polite people and we do what we are told normally. Yeah. That also means that uh, if we are called in for a follow, we will, we will come. Right, we do what we are told to. That is in our genes, yeah. and we also there is a great interest from the from everyone. I would say to participate. So it's not difficult. Uh, of course, if you're not sick, you don't want to participate. But if you have that disease, uh, there is a great willingness actually to recruit patients. It's not that difficult to recruit patients. Uh, unless that you have a very narrow indication. So I would say that is some of the things that I would like to highlight for the Scandinavian countries. And I think actually also it is applicable for Finland, even though it's a little further away, both yeah. cultural wise and language wise. Okay, great. So that's very interesting. So even patients are a little bit audit trailed than in Scandinavian yes. countries. <laughs> Yeah, perfect. Yeah. Okay. Can you also tell me um, a bit about the regulatory framework in Scandinavia? Yeah. Uh, right now, the, all the Scandinavian countries are regulated by the Medical Device Directive. And that means that, uh, again, because we are polite people and the European Union dictated at that time a law which were meant as a free trade uh, directive, we implemented direct, directly the directive in, for instance, the Danish legislation. And I see the same similarities in Norway and, and in Sweden. It's a little different again in, in Finland. But that means that if you uh, know the MDD, uh, that is more or less copy paste into our legislation. It's very unified, the small differences, but we follow basically the uh, uh, the rules that are in the directive. We are small, right? So we yeah. we take it directly where if you go to Italy or Germany, your law is more specifically adapted to your countries, you also larger countries. But yeah. that means that you have specific rules in Italy, you will have to, if I remember correctly, a, a representative in Italy. So there are certain this free trade directive, which is was meant for kind of, it disappeared a little bit when that yeah. directive came into force way back. Um, in in that regards, we're also considering the, uh, not only the directive, we have the other um, regulatory space around uh, the law that the competent authorities are, are uh, responsible for. This is the ethics committee, uh, both in Sweden and Norway uh, and in Denmark. They're very, they're first of all regional uh, and they are uh, running in parallel with the application process for the competent authorities. There is a big trust between these two uh, units and the ethical committees um, are very focused mainly on the ethical aspects of the trial, meaning that uh, they leave it to the competent authorities to look at the technical part. It's the same in Germany, I know, but you also have some hospital ethics committee that are more product oriented, where we have these regional uh, committees 
when you if you have multi-center trial in in Denmark you apply for the main committee get the approval and then it applies for the whole country the same is in Sweden and in Norway okay mm -hmm. um, as these um, the regulation be uh, applicable for the ethical concerns uh, are really basically to uh, regulate the communication with the patients and how we ethically conduct these studies. Uh, it is, um, at least in Denmark, I know we have some very nice, uh, nicely written guidelines. And if you follow the guidelines, and as I said before, do what you're told, yeah. <laughs> the checklist, then you get the approval quite fast because we also stick to the deadlines. Yeah. So I would say uh, if you do what you are told to by the committees and the competent authorities, they also stick to their timelines. So the competent authorities are the 60 days. And now with the COVID-19, we are, they have a huge backlog of the ethics committee, but normally you could actually get ethics committee approval within these 60 days also. Yeah. Yeah. So quite reliable, and it's it's predictable, it's repeatable. The the system, yeah. I would say. Yeah. Ah, oh, perfect. I like this. Yeah, I think in, in, in the big um, EU countries, they overinterpreted sometimes uh, the MDD, especially the, we Germans are very well known for that, and they always put it one level on the requirement on on the rules and made it stricter and stricter. And then I like your approach, actually, just copy paste it and, and work accordingly. Perfect. Um, then we have a um, um, very strange situation, at least for um, companies coming from the US, um, when you combine a medical device and a drug. And you told me already uh, that you have a lot of very innovative companies in Scandinavian countries. Um, I know also we, I worked for, for a Norwegian company which developed uh, combination products where you combine the medical device with a drug. And in the US you have um, particular regulations which cover these combination products. In Europe um, it's more or less an unregulated um, environment. Um, in Germany, you need to work strictly according to drug law and medical device law. It's very confusing because sometimes you need to choose one rule, sometimes the other rule. How is it in Scandinavia? And I think it's an interesting topic because uh, we are getting more and more of these combination products. Uh, and uh, most of the companies don't understand how they need to develop the product. Yeah. Yeah, I think under the directive, it it has actually uh, it, the way that I have experienced is that for many years, drug companies having a, a device component have more or less seen the device component as an accessory, and not really it was just something, you know, packaging more or less. <laughs> and I think uh, uh, the way that uh, I saw that the wake up came. For uh, in risk in this regard, for some of the drug companies, was actually the FDA that kind of said, uh, "Can you please send me some data on the device that you are using with the drug?" And then, oh, what what is this? A device? It's it's just a whatever it was. And uh, well, where is your uh, safety data and your you know the labels and the your performance characteristics and uh, all these things? And then it started rolling that, well, considering this, we would have to implement the device part in our clinical studies because we are not collecting data points to support the device part. Yeah. So, and I think that has been a struggle for, for quite some years. And uh, the other way around where we have device companies using a drug uh, in combination with that, um, they are, sometimes forgetting that they have a drug. And there are also some of the drugs, uh, which now under MDR are considered as drugs, but before were just kind of medical components or whatever it's mm -hmm. called. There wasn't really any regulation around it. Now they have to wake up and find out that they need to go this extra uh, circle around some pharmaceutical agent 
or sorry, some uh, agency that can evaluate the data which are uh, for this uh, medical component that they're using. And I actually see quite, I have few of the companies that we are working with have actually um, uh, decided to take away the drug part from their device just to avoid, and then the, the, uh, uh, the users can mix themselves uh, the drug into, if it's possible, just yeah. to avoid that uh, complication. Yeah, 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 of course, smart approach. But I think we could um, talk many, many hours about combination products. Let's go yeah. back to the medical devices. And um, as we know, the medical device regulation has been already delayed by one year, but in May it will start then. So May 2021, it's getting uh, to be effective. And um, it's a big step for Europe. I'm Honestly, I'm a fan um, of the MDR because, um, as you said already, the MDD could be interpreted in different countries differently. Um, and the MDR as a super law um, works completely different. Uh, what do you expect uh, from the MDR in Scandinavia? Uh, for the, um, I will mention two uh, parts, basically. It's the companies and then the, the hospitals. Uh, the companies are uh, they are the startup companies and the more established companies. And uh, to the startup companies, of course, it's easier because they don't have the old rules. But it is uh, the regulation, which is it's more or less obvious, eighty ninety percent of it, what we have to do. And there is a great resemblance to the medical device directive, but it is kind of of difficult to navigate if you don't have the experience. I see that as a startup company. Uh, I would say for more established manufacturers, larger manufacturers, to change that uh, setting from MDD to MDR is, is really, really difficult. It requires a lot of work and a lot of cleaning uh, documentation, not so much because of the MDR, but because it's just old documents, right? Yeah. It's not been up there for many, many years and just been laying there. And now all of a sudden, because of the MDR, you have to update it. And they found out oh, the indication for use, it's not uh, what's on the label and what did we actually discuss. And if we take that label, we are missing clinical data. Where is the claims table? You know, it's, it's that discussion everywhere. So uh, I think it's a big, big hurdle and preparing for the change in the equivalence principle, making sure that you have the clinical data available to start using the equivalence again, uh, is uh, for companies that have never conducted clinical studies before and is trying really hard to avoid it, uh, also makes it quite difficult. So yeah. uh, it's a big burden to them. And many of them actually have the financial capabilities, but they simply per principle things that this is not necessary. We have been selling this for years, <laughs> right? Yeah. Not as a legacy product, but really, uh, so that understanding, and it will come when the notified body uh, starts pushing back, I'm quite sure, and start to uh, push back to see the link between the internal documentation and real life clinical evidence and the post-market clinical uh, studies. Uh, but we are all waiting for that uh, feedback. And if, um, if I look at the hospitals, uh, we work a lot with the hospitals because they both have their own production of medical devices often. They also do investigative initiated studies uh, where we are working with them to comply with the ISO 1455 and also now the medical device regulation. And to prepare them to do clinical studies on absolutely uh, how do you say that uh, devices which are not of research interest at all? Introducer sheets, guideline, uh, guide wires, um, other products that are class three products that needs clinical data and where we have to go and ask the professor, can you please do a clinical study on a guide wire and he, you know, how to do that. But trying to tell the story that we will have 
we will have to collect some data from somewhere to start this uh, evidence cascade, basically, under the MDR. And we need to work with the hospitals to get this. And in the Scandinavian countries, again, because we, we are all, we have a, each uh, um, citizen in Denmark, for instance, have this number, CPR number. Uh, we also register at the hospitals and everything is registered. And now with the different barcodes, the, all the products that are used um, are also registered at the hospitals. So to start preparing them to see the interest in also collecting data on maybe not really interesting products, kind of yeah. registered uh, data is, uh, is something that I spend quite some time on because we will have to use all the data that uh, we can find uh, to be able to support the MDR. Yeah, 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 very interesting. You mentioned already the ISO 14155. Um, are people aware about this ISO standard? Um, I mean, for drug studies, we all know GCP and um, we do a lot of GCP trainings and everybody can download GCP from internet. Um, ISO 14155, people need to buy. Yeah? And at least I can say the investigators I met, uh, they would not be willing to buy an ISO standard for 100 bucks. So what is with the Scandinavian? Uh, because of your high educational level, I could imagine that uh, they are more interested in learning something about the ISO standard, but I'm not sure. <laughs> Yeah, it is. Uh, I think it's normally provided by the companies. They actually buy the standard, buy a license, and then add that yeah. to the site files. And we do a lot of teaching and training in the ISO 14155. Uh, also, because the competent authorities are really, when they do the inspections, they ask you, where is yeah. your ISO 14155? You're doing yeah. device studies. Uh, and maybe it's because th these two segments in the competent authorities are kind of separated. The pharma and vice punch, two different yeah. uh, groups of people. So they are specifically asking for that and training specifically in the ISO 14155. But it is, of course, a problem that it's be you have to buy it. The good thing now with the MDR is that the ISO standard is more or less implemented in the MDR. Yeah. So now, and uh, even though that the MDR is based on the 2011 version and not the new version. So now we yeah. have the confusion again, right? But at least it's it's in the law now, right? So uh, so uh, that makes so it easier. Perfect. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. And you mentioned already the inspections. Um, what kind of inspections do you have? We have actually uh, only inspections from the competent authorities, and uh, of course from uh, a. I haven't really, the notified bodies are of course also around. The ethics committees, uh, we have actually only seen that in Germany, that the ethics committee are coming out for audits. Uh, so it's mainly the competent authorities that you are seeing for, for these activities. Yeah, okay. Yeah, in Germany, actually the ethics committees uh, maybe years ago they were allowed, but nowadays they also due to um, data protection reasons they are not allowed to do um, inspections. You mentioned um, notified bodies. Do you have your own notified bodies in some of these Scandinavian countries? I mean, the big ones are always known, TÜV, DECRA, um, BSI, but I actually don't have, I don't know a Scandinavian one. No, we have PreSafe. PreSafe is a, a large Norwegian company that have established their notified body. And we have had a, a Danish uh, part of that, but right now it's implemented under the, the Norwegian uh, office. So we don't have a Danish one, but there's one in Norway. I cannot remember if there is anyone in Sweden, but Finland has one. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Oh, great. Um, so let's speak a little bit about study processes. And I mean, we are now in, in the middle of the COVID crisis um, and the trend goes more to remote work, home office, remote work, uh, but we need to control somehow study data. I recognize th this trend already prior to COVID, to be honest, um, just to save time and money. Um, I know the Scandinavian countries always as very modern and 
innovative countries. When I think about the one of the biggest mobile phone uh, manufacturers, no Nokia was uh, very early on the market, very big, and you all had mobile phones already uh, much earlier than we had in Germany. And um, do you also feel the trend in Scandinavia now to work more remotely, remote control, remote monitoring? Um, are you again years um, in advance compared to us? Um, it's actually some quite strict regulation around that. We're not allowed to share uh, source data outside of the hospital. So remote yeah. STV is um, difficult and you have to yeah. apply specifically for that. And uh, the, uh, so I, if we are in front there, I'm not sure, uh, but we need new tools basically to be more flexible. Uh, and I know this uh, kind of COVID crisis have made us rethink these processes to become more flexible and also more the cost, right? It's, it's really uh, very expensive uh, running clinical studies and with the monitoring. So I think that there's a lot of new tools coming out, but in, in Denmark, at least the remote monitoring is, is not allowed. You will have to ask specifically for an amendment here on the COVID-19 to be able to do it. You're not able to fax or send out for any yeah. not defined purposes. So maybe yeah. it's the same in Germany. Yeah, it's very similar. Of course, um, data protection is very important and um, remote source data uh, verification is difficult because data should not um, uh, remove from the study sites but at least remote control of data so not verification but yes. are they logical do they make sense um, are they uh, complete that can already be checked uh, remotely and then you just need to spend a little time to do um, the remaining source data verification on site um, yes. but less on site monitoring compared to to years before definitely and and I think that we have good tools for that. And there is a lot of office work uh, now. If I just look five years back, uh, yeah. much more work is done at the office before yeah. you go to the site and then concentrate on the STV completely. I agree. That's yeah. where we all are here. Yeah. And we, we have also more and more source uh, software as, as medical devices. And sometimes you can also connect software to clinical databases where you can um, check the data automatically. Um, and I think it would make sense to go to the site to check if the software is um, uh, properly used. You can yes. also do it remotely. You, know, you just need to, to be a little bit innovative. And, and, uh, and I think when we, when we develop a lot of very innovative um, products, we cannot do our clinical research work like 20 years ago. It doesn't make sense. No, yeah, yeah. it doesn't make sense, yeah. exactly. <laughs> yeah. Okay, um, if a company would come to you, uh, let's say typically from Germany, and says, um, Helen, could you help us with uh, clinical development? We consider Scandinavian countries or the, the region Scandinavia as good place for clinical studies, what would you recommend to them and what are no-goes when you go uh, into the, your countries? Um, I think it really depends on the product and, and the trial that they would like to perform. Uh, what, um, some trials, uh, if you have a very innovative product, I would definitely recommend you to go to some of the key hospitals, the main hospitals. Uh, it's, they are running a very professional clinical uh, setup. They run it as a business, right? So not only for research, but simply also to produce data for manufacturers. And that makes a reliable system that it's put into the organizations that they have a a kind of a group of people that are conducting research for companies. When you go to smaller hospitals, of course, these are not bad data. It's just another organizational stuff. And for some products, you would uh, actually benefit from going to these hospitals and, of course, get the almost 100% attention 
uh, from from this uh, maybe a single study coordinator that is running everything but they are also very easily to dis, uh, not distract but they have um, as a focus the patient care so the reliability is getting lower so it really depends on the product that you are coming with uh, in the um, I would always uh, recommend to get some help with the submissions. As I say, it's um, it's very much about the wording and stick to what is told. If you do that, you will get the approval fast. And other cultures and, and uh, people from outside not really used to that cultural setting, they want to argue with the ethics committee and they want to negotiate. And that's not the case, right? Do the thing yeah. on the checklist and then get it going. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, so that's not the way that that these um, people are, are are working. And it's the same with the competent authorities. They have a checklist, follow it, then you will be good to go. Yeah. Uh, so I think that's the key. Yeah. Perfect. Great. Thank you very much. I think uh, it was very interesting and, and I hope a lot of people will go to Scandinavia with their uh, products. Um, I love Scandinavia. I like the people very much because they are reliable, as you said. And if you expect a high level of integrity, you also need to go to reliable people. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's what you can find in Scandinavia, I'm, I'm sure. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Sorry. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you. I also hope that you liked our video. Please leave your comments, leave your questions. If you have suggestions for new topics, send us an email and subscribe us. Take care. Bye bye.